This is part four of topic four on electrical behavior and diffusion. In this part of the notes, we'll be talking about solid state diffusion, what it requires to happen, and what it is exactly. So remember, we're talking about the diffusion mechanism, the way in which atoms move through other um, solid materials. So for example, if I have boron and I want to move boron into silicon, I have to have a mechanism, a way in which that boron can actually move through the silicon crystal. In addition to that, I have to have something called the energetic driving force. This is a defect or a mistake, something wrong with the crystal that can, that can be changed in order to reduce the energy of the overall system. <clears throat> and lastly, I need to have some kind of thermal energy, usually in the form of applied heat, so that the atoms have enough energy to actually move around inside the solid. Together, these three elements give us the, the process called diffusion. So what is diffusion? It's the redistribution of material by thermally activated atomic motion in order to reduce an energetic driving force. So basically we're moving around material by heating up the atoms and the atoms move in such a way that they reduce an energetic driving force, some defect or something wrong with the, with the system. And oftentimes this driving force that gets reduced is the distribution of one element within another. So let's look at a simple example. <coughs> Imagine that we took a piece of pure copper and a piece of pure nickel and stuck them together in an atomically perfect way and put it inside a furnace. Initially, the composition would be 100% copper in the copper sample and that would drop off to 0% copper in the nickel sample. Now imagine that we turn on the furnace and heat the sample up to some high temperature. After a period of time, some of the nickel will move into vacancy positions, creating openings for the copper to move into the nickel. And the same thing will happen vice versa for the nickel to move into the copper. So we see after a short period of time that there are copper atoms inside the nickel and nickel atoms inside the copper. The composition is no longer a complete drop off. There's a gradient between the pure copper on the far left and the pure nickel on the far right. Eventually, after a very, very long period of time, we'll have a completely random distribution of copper and nickel atoms within one another. This would give a uniform distribution of approximately 50% copper and have the lowest energy for the system. This is diffusion at work. And in fact, this experiment was done at the University of Michigan in the 1940s to prove that diffusion was something real and to actually calculate or come up with equations for calculating the diffusion behavior. Let's look at another example of diffusion in xenon particles and aluminum. <clears throat> so here we have a high-resolution high transmission electron microscope image of xenon particles, that's the large atoms here, surrounded by smaller aluminum ions in a regular lattice orientation. Now this is at time t equals zero as diffusion is just about to start. Notice what happens after 47 seconds. <clears throat> the xenon atoms have moved into a position between the two particles. The net effect is to reduce the surface area of the particles by creating a neck. That reduction in surface area reduces the overall energy of the system by getting rid of the surface defect of the area or the phase interface between the aluminum and the xenon. If we continue to let the diffusion process occur over, say, t equals 145 seconds, we see that ultimately we wind up with one complete particle. There's something else here that's important to notice, and that is that the process involves the xenon staying in the same lattice stru structure as it diffuses across the gap between the two particles, pushing the aluminum out of the way and filling in with xenon. The crystal structure is never lost. That means the diffusion is happening by substitutional impurity atoms moving through the lattice structure of the aluminum. So what are the requirements for diffusion that we've already talked about? Well first of all we need a driving force. There has to be some defect present in the system such as the phase interface and the xenon particles we just saw or the non-uniform distribution of copper and nickel in the example before that. The goal of diffusion then is to eliminate this defect over time. If there is no defect or no driving force, the atoms can still move around, but they're moving around randomly, and we don't notice any net change in the system. We also need energy of some kind in order to provide the atoms with the 
enough energy to move around inside the crystal. If it were absolute zero, there'd be no energy and therefore no ability for the atoms to move from one position to another. Typically, this energy comes in the form of heat. There are two basic diffusion mechanisms, or two ways that, that impurity atoms can move through a crystal. The first is called vacancy diffusion. In vacancy diffusion, an impurity atom moves from one lattice position, here, into the vacancy site next to it. Let's take a look at an animation, or at least let's try to look at an animation. No, it's not going to work. The link is broken. That's too bad. Well, at any rate, <clears throat> we move from one position to the next position. Now, what this requires is that there actually be vacancy positions available for us to move into. And the only way to have vacancies is to have enough thermal energy that the atoms are vibrating and therefore create those vacancies. So vacancy diffusion generally occurs at higher temperatures where there's enough vacancies present for the diffusion to occur. And it occurs more easily when the impurity atom is approximately the same size as the vacancy position it's about to occupy. If it's much bigger or much smaller, the diffusion occurs much more slowly. The other diffusion mechanism is interstitial diffusion. In this case, an impurity atom occupies an interstitial site, as in this case, and moves from that interstitial site to another nearby interstitial site, resulting in a net movement of material. <clears throat> In this case, the temperature can be much lower because we don't have to create the interstitial sites. They naturally exist within the crystalline lattice. In addition to that, the atoms that are moving via interstitial diffusion are always going to be very small, such as carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, boron, and so on. Just remember that for vacancy diffusion, the influence of temperature is very important. This equation defines the number of vacancies present per unit volume of material. And if we took n sub v, the number of vacancies, and divided by n, the number of lattice sites, we could calculate the percentage of lattice sites that are actually occupied by vacancies. Notice that it's equal to the exponent of negative 1 over the temperature. That means that as temperature goes up, n sub v will also go up, exactly as we would expect. Let's try a Monte Carlo simulation and see if that works for us. No, can't work with that either. I gotta get these fixed. So at any rate, <coughs> the influence of atom size. Solvent atoms and diffusing atoms must be roughly the same size. And that's because the, the diffusing atom has to fit into the vacancy sites left behind when the solvent atom moves off. As we said before, interstitial diffusion occurs at lower temperatures because there's no need to create the vacancies. But the higher the temperature, the faster the diffusion rate will occur because the atoms can move more quickly. And as we said before, interstitial site atoms are going to be small, such as hydrogen, carbon, carbon oxygen, and nitrogen. So let's take a look at this simple example. Well, maybe not so simple. In this case, what we've done is taken a chunk of molybdenum, a pure chunk of molybdenum metal, and coated it with a coating of silicon carbide. But notice what's happened. The silicon and the carbon have diffused into the molybdenum. So here are some questions for you. Why does carbon appear to diffuse further into the molybdenum than the silicon does? The answer to this question is that carbon is a much smaller element and therefore is diffusing via interstitial diffusion. Because it's diffusing it via interstitial diffusion, it can move at a faster rate than the silicon atoms which are moving via substitutional or vacancy diffusion. Here's a second question. Why hasn't the molybdenum diffused into the silicon carbide? Well, we have to remember that molybdenum is a relatively large element. And, in fact, it's quite a bit bigger than both silicon and carbon. So it's going to have a difficult time moving via interstitial diffusion. So it's probably going to move into silicon carbide via vacancy diffusion. But there's another problem here. In order to have vacancy diffusion, we need vacancies. And silicon carbide has covalent bonds, which are very strong bonds. So with such strong bonds, you'd have to have a very high temperature in order to generate sufficient vacancies for the molybdenum to diffuse into the silicon carbide. 
So here's an example of where vacancy diffusion and interstitial diffusion are competing with one another, and the interstitial diffusion clearly wins out.